Hey everybody, this is Matt from Matt's Fantasy Book Reviews, and today I'm going to be doing a full breakdown of the 10 most popular adult fantasy series. This video is going to be aimed at those that are just getting into fantasy or have been reading a little bit but still haven't hit all the hits in this genre. But even if you've read a lot, I hope this video can come in handy. So in this video, I'm going to be going over a basic synopsis of the series or the first book in the series and some pros and cons, not so much my pros and cons, but the overwhelming majority of people, what they would say about these books. I'm going to be doing no spoilers for any of these books. And what I consider no spoilers is if it shows up in the back of the book when you're reading about it, then I'm not going to be going into any more depth than that. But if you think the back of a book is a spoiler, then this will be spoilers. But I don't think most people consider it that way, um, so I'm not either. Number one is going to be Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson. Uh, this is a series that is currently ongoing. There's been four out of ten books already written, and these are very large books. The first book being The Way of Kings. So let me give you a breakdown about what The Way of Kings is all about. So this world takes place where these regular crazy events happen, where enormous storms happen that totally have changed the landscape and the people that live on this world of Roshar. You know, when these storms happen, you know, animals hide in their shells, um, grass literally goes back underground, and they've had to completely build their structures so that they're on the other side of where the storms come from, on like the side of a mountain, so that they're not gonna get completely demolished. So many centuries have passed since the fall of the Knights Radiant, and this was a group of people that essentially protected the world from evil. But they left behind these shard blades and shard plate, these magical swords and armor that can turn regular men into crazy warlords. Um, and these are insanely expensive and rare. So in the first book, there's three main stories that are being told here. First, you have Kaladin. He's a slave who's trying to rise up in the world. Uh, next, you have Dalinar, and he leads one of ten armies who fight against an enemy and a seemingly never-ending battle that you'll find a lot more about as the series progresses. And his son, Adeline, um, who's trying to find his place in the world. And finally, you have Shallon, and she's trying to become a scholar, but she's got some ulterior motives. So as the books go along, they get a lot of different POVs, and a major split's gonna happen after the fifth book with a big time jump and going over a totally different group of people. And I'm, everyone's really excited to see what that's all about. And each book has this aspect to it where they investigate the background of a certain character via flashbacks. Um, so in one of the books, uh, Kaladin, who's one of the main people, you know, every several chapters or so, you'll hear this different story about his childhood. And it's always very, very entrancing to learn about these characters, get much more in depth into them and figure out what makes them tick. So I think you should read this book if you're really into a huge believable world that feels larger than life with tons of different locations that you just can't stop thinking about with a gorgeous map uh, that'll just totally enrapture you in the world and the world building that's going on. I also think that you'll like this if you're into a lot of different points of view characters. Uh, it's going to investigate lots of different people and go into their lives. It's not overwhelming, but it's definitely a major feature of these books. I think you'll also like it if you're into a relatively complex story. This isn't, you don't need to be a genius to follow along with what's going on here, but it is more complex than most of the books that I'm going to be going over today. I also think you'll like it if you're into like a really rich, unique magic system. Uh, this is regularly thought of as having some of the best magic in all of fantasy uh, that's so well thought out. Um, Brandon Sanderson's really famous for this, and, and magic systems are, 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 he puts a ton of thought and energy into making these work in a very believable and inventive way. The lore is also really fantastic here. I mean, you'll get lost in the history of these characters, the history of the, the different locations that they go to, um, the, the truth versus the not truths over the history that they all believe that they know. And it's just, the lore is really top tier for fantasy. I also think you'll like this if you're into progression. And what I mean by progression is kind of a steady increase in power in your main characters where they're not gonna really falter and, and, and get down in the dumps without you knowing that they'll be picked back up again and, and be stronger than they were before. It also has this really nice feature of foreshadowing and twists um, and believable twists where they happen and you kind of 
will be like, oh man, I totally should have seen that coming because it's been building up for not, not only chapters, but books ahead of time and will really leave you reeling from the major reveals that happen. I also think you'll like this book if you like major set pieces of your endings. You know, th this book is famous for having huge events. All the main characters are kind of building towards this major thing that will happen at the end of each book and what they call is a Sanderlanch. That's a Brandon Sanderson avalanche of events that happens at the end and you won't be able to put down the last 100 or 200 pages of any of these books. And in general, this is a hero story with clear good guys and clear bad guys and people that you can really root for. And the last thing I'll say is the character development. It's extremely top notch and you're gonna learn so much about these characters, sometimes too much, um, but if you like good character development, this is the series for you. So here's some of the well-known cons of Stormlight Archive. Uh, one of them is that the prose is just so-so. And what I mean by prose is, you know, just the writing quality. It's not lyrical. You're not gonna feel this poetic nature of the way that it's written. And you're not gonna just gush over the way that the words are put on the page. You know, this is a story where that's the forefront of this. It's not trying to impress you with the huge complex writing quality where you're gonna have to be looking up words in the dictionary because they're so inventive and it's, it's none of that. This also has a pretty slow start. This first book starts slow. It's all about developing these characters and setting the stages for the major events that are about to happen. You know, ultimately these are huge books and that might be a turnoff for some people. Um, each of the books is, you know, at least a thousand pages long. And that can be daunting for the average person when you might not have a ton of time to read and that might take you months to get through. It's also been criticized for having almost too much detail. Um, you know, people have said that you could cut out hundreds of pages out of these books and not lose an awful lot. Now, some people may like that. They may really be into detail, but if, you know, if you're into major plot points um, and you can kind of get lost in the stuff in between, this can be a little tough. You know, this also could have a little bit of a steep learning curve for some, and you're gonna feel a little bit lost with how foreign this world is, and that it doesn't really handhold you in explaining every little thing up front. Now, this isn't the most complex book in the world, but it is more complex than most. Also, if you're not reading all of the books that Brandon Sanderson has written, you know, there are Easter eggs that get dropped of the other books into these and some characters that can even cross from the other books into this. And so you might feel a not so much lost, but that you're missing a small piece of this if you're not reading the whole big Cosmere, which is what all of Brandon Sanderson's books kind of tie into, or most of them. Um, and you'll lose a little bit out of that. And lastly, these books aren't going to be done for a really long time. You know, Brandon Sanderson is a prolific writer. But the current plan is this, the 10th book will probably come out in the 2040s. Now that, for some people you might say, I wanna be in for the ride. But for some, that can be a daunting prospect that you have so long to be able to finish up this series. Number two has to be Mistborn. And this is also by Brandon Sanderson. There's been six total books written in this series out of what's probably gonna end up being 13 books. It's split up into trilogies, although the second one is gonna be a quartet. Um, and that fourth book is going to come out later on this year. And then two more trilogies. And the, essentially what it's broken down into is major time jumps into each of the trilogies and a big change in tone, characters. And you can really read these trilogies as without knowing much about the other ones. But it's probably best to kind of go in order. But mostly I want to talk about the first trilogy. And that's the one that people gush about. The first book being The Final Empire. And basically what happens in this story is, this is a story of what would happen if the prophesized hero of the world failed and the Dark Lord won. Think like the opposite of what happened in The Lord of the Rings. So for thousands of years before this book has began, it's been raining ash and the Ska people have lived in misery and the Lord Ruler reigns supreme with complete power. Now a man named Kelsier finds himself with the powers of a Mistborn, which essentially give him tons of different types of superpowers. Um, he forms a team of people who all have individual powers, he has them all, to essentially do a heist to take down the ruler. And, and that's the basic summary of this book. It's a heist book um, and extremely fun. So for the pros for Mistborn, this is always gonna be going down as probably the best magic system in all of fantasy. It's inventive. It's totally unique. It's extremely fun. And the main crux of it is that characters have to 
um, take doses of different types of metal alloys that each give them different powers if they already have the ability to, to learn those. And it's not so much that part that's interesting, it's what the powers do. And I won't ruin any of them because it's so fun to learn about them each individually as the story goes along, but rest assured, it's amazing. Also, this conclusion to this trilogy is some of the best stuff in fantasy. If you want to be guaranteed that you're going to be wowed by the ending of a series, check out Mistborn. The twists that happen here are amazing, and they really make this story. And it's some of the best twists that have ever been done. Where at some of the twists you'll read, you'll say, I now misunderstand and have a different appreciation for everything that happened before this. And I almost guarantee that you're going to finish that third book saying, I can't wait to read this trilogy again, with a totally different understanding of what just happened. It's going to make you want to reread. This is also a lighter read. These books aren't huge for a fantasy book. Probably, I don't know, 500 pages each, which isn't enormous for a fantasy book. But you can, and it's only three books, so it's not the most large time investment you're going to have to make reading a fantasy series. It also has a little bit of a rare thing for fantasy in that it's got a, a female lead um, through most of the chapters of this book. And she's an extremely well-written protagonist that you're going to fall in love with reading about this character. Also, if you like a good heist, man, this book is good. Now, a heist isn't only what this book about, but it has the same structure as a heist where you're putting the team together, you're trying to execute the major plan, and it's got all the fun hijinks that go along with that. And yeah, if you like a good heist, check this out. Um, and finally, this is rather easily digestible. Um, it's not necessarily a YA story, although it has some aspects of that, but you're gonna be able to not have to you know, write down notes. You're gonna understand everything that happens right when you read it, and it's not gonna be too stressful of a read by any means. Now for the negatives. So again, just like all Brandon Sanderson books, the prose is just gonna be so-so. Nothing that's gonna wow you, it's basic stuff. And like I said just a minute ago, you know, this is a little bit more YA oriented. It's not classified as a YA book, I don't think, but it's probably more YA than any of the other books in this adult fantasy list that I'm gonna be going over. It also is basically good versus bad. There's not a lot of gray in between. There's a little bit, but if you like books with a little bit more gray in your characters, yeah, you're not gonna find a ton of that in Mistborn. The romance subplot also, there's one major romance that happens in this book and it feels forced. It's not the greatest romance story that's ever been and you're gonna roll your eyes a little bit about how that goes down. Also, the middle book is kind of mostly recognized as being the weakest of the bunch and it definitely has that middle book syndrome where it doesn't super know what it wants to be uh, and the ending, you know, it doesn't end a major story. It, it, it just sets up the next one. And that's always a little bit hard for a book to do. Um, but, but yeah, it definitely has middle book syndrome. Number three is gonna be A Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin. There's been five out of seven total books written in this series. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about Game of Thrones. Um, that's what the Game of Thrones TV show is based off of. Um, and it's called A Song of Ice and Fire. So. If you don't know what this is all about, and you probably have seen Game of Thrones by now, I feel like everybody has, but let me give you a little bit of a breakdown about what this is all about. So long ago, there was this major event that threw the seasons totally out of balance. And now seasons can last for decades. So when the book starts, winter is coming, and this intense force of evil is massing on the other side of the Northern Wall that wants to come over and wreck humanity. So in the South, uh, the king's most trusted advisor is found dead under mysterious circumstances, and enemies from within and without are emerging to try to take the king down. So in, in Winterfell, north of the South area, but south of the Wall, um, Ned Stark has been summoned to take the place of that advisor that got killed, and he brings his family south with him. So this is a story of lords and soldiers and ladies and sorcerers and assassins and dragons and princes and treachery and, and a major political drama of a series. So the first pro that I have to say is that this series is absolutely worth watching if you've already seen the show. Uh, the further you get into the series, the more it diverges from the plot. And, and, and at, towards the end of the show, it's kind of unrecognizable to the way that the books have gone. So. Yeah, if you've watched the show, you can absolutely still read this and get an immense amount of enjoyment. Probably more enjoyment than you did out of the show. Now, the, the lore here is top tier. Um, they go into the history of this world and 
you know, the truths and not truths about what people understand about it are very evident here. And it's just a very rich lore and a very rich world. This is an enormous world with major events happening even completely outside of the major plot of this because they, this spans continents um, with their own conflicts going on. And it's just so fun to read about a world that just feels bigger than life. Now this is a top-notch political fantasy book. If you like like a political thriller, this book has it all. Now it's a lot more than that, but the political machinations of all the characters really come to the forefront here and it's very well done. The twists are incredible. And if you've watched the show, you know what I'm talking about, but you are gonna get blindsided. Major characters are gonna get killed that you never saw coming. And it's just, it's gonna slap you across the face every single book with major reveals that have been set up for a long time coming to come crashing down on you and you're gonna be devastated or cheering, but no matter what you feel, it's gonna be surprise. Now, the first three books of this series are critically acclaimed. Everyone loved the first, loves the first three books of the series. I just book, did a, a video recently where I went through my, my top 28 favorite fantasy booktubers and asked them what their favorite book was. And four of them said that the third book from this series is their absolute favorite of all time. The pacing in these books is incredible. It does this amazing blend of fast, edgier seat stuff and then calming down, showing deeper character development before it ramps back up again. It's very well done. I'd also say that this book does a very good blend of being, being digestible, but also complex. If you really want to get into the background of these books, there's tons of reading you can do, and you can pick up on these little tidbits. But if you just want to rush through and aren't into that kind of thing, you're going to understand this plot just as much as everybody else will as well. So let's talk about cons and let's hit the ma major big one out right out of the gate. These books might never get done. Um, George R. R. Martin is famous for having the shows totally overlap him and how fast he was getting the books out. And it has been an extreme amount of time, and I say that lightly, from when the last book came out until now. And we're still waiting on that next book that has been promised to have come for years now. And there's not a lot of faith that two more books are gonna get written. That's what he needs to be able to finish this out. You know, I suspect that he'll be able to get one more out, but the second one is really pushing it. And that might not be for everybody. Now, I still think it's worth it to read, um, but it's a major, major con. So while I said the first three books were critically acclaimed, I can't say they all are. Because the last two books in the series, everyone agrees they're a lower quality than the first three books. And that's an unfortunate trend. You want them to get better over time. These books kind of hit a crescendo in the middle. Um, you know, book three was better than book two, book two was better than book one, but then four and five had a pretty big downturn because they got tedious, they had editing problems, and they just weren't as tight of books. Now, the large number of characters here can be a turnoff um, because it can get a little confusing on what's happening, who's who, characters will pop up that haven't shown up for a book or two, it can feel a little bit overwhelming at times. Now, there, as for having these scenes, and so if that's something that worries you about your books, you know, that's gonna happen here. Um, also, kind of a funny one, but the author has this weird tendency to overly describe food. You're gonna read pages upon pages upon pages of descriptions of every single course in every single banquet. He's obsessed with writing about food, and if you're like me and you couldn't care less, you're gonna be skipping many paragraphs or pages throughout the series when you don't care about that, but it's kind of weird and it happens all the time. Number four has got to be The Wheel of Time. This is written by both Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson, and this is 14 or 15 books, depending on if you want to count the prequel or not. Um, but this is a long book series, and it all starts with The Eye of the World. Now, where this book starts out is a group of friends who live in the small village leading a normal village life. Um, one day, this Aes Sedai comes, and this is a woman who can channel magic. And she shows up looking for the prophesized one who's gonna go up and battle against the dark one. And you don't really know exactly who it's gonna be, um, but you kinda know it's gonna be one of these kids. They then go on a quest um, to return back to the White Tower where the Aes Sedai are headquartered on the other side of the continent, evading danger and having epic adventure along the way. So as the series goes on, the central plot 
um, comes all down to this major battle that has to happen between the prophesized one and the dark one. And this is a relatively complex story with tons of POVs and an enormous cast of characters. So for things to like about this book, the lore and the world are incredible. You know, the world building here is just magical. And you know, I don't know that a lot of people have ever done better than what Robert Jordan set the stage for here. This is an enormous world with tons of individualized locations that all feel a little bit different. Um, you know, many dozens, if not hundreds of different locations happening throughout this book. Other continents that you don't even know what's going on on, but they have some involvement in the plot. Um, different races of people that kind of come and go. It's amazing and so well done. This is a grand adventure story. It's fun. Um, but you're gonna, every book is gonna be a total romp of a story where some major conflict has to happen that they have to do to march them towards the final goal. But yeah, it is just a fun, yet accessible story that has a lot of complexity, kind of like Game of Thrones, but you know, you're gonna understand what's going on here. This is also a series that has been completed. You know, fantasy is famous for series that might not ever get to that final stage. And for a book series this long, you know, it's notable that, you know, you can start reading this and know that you can still pick up the last book and it is done. This book also has some incredible characters. Um, while they have a lot more than just this, I want to highlight one of them. And whenever you read like a, a Reddit thread or something about who are the best characters in all of fantasy, right at the top of that list is going to be Matt Cawthon from this book. You're going to fall in love with this character, I guarantee. And it might not be in the first or second book, but eventually you're going to say every time a Matt chapter comes in, you're going to... You're going to be so excited about reading more about the hijinks that this character gets into. All right, now let's talk about the cons, uh, the big one right out of the gate. This first book is a Lord of the Rings ripoff. This is written at a time when fantasy books didn't really get published unless they shared or borrowed a lot from Lord of the Rings. And it is very evident here. Uh, you know, it's not like the same kind of characters and stuff, but the, the plot is the same as the Lord of the Rings. Now it diverges quickly after the second book comes along, but yeah, get ready for that first book to be a ripoff. Um, this is also a very good versus bad story. The bad guys are literally kind of named the bad guys and the good guys are very clearly gonna be good, but not a lot of turnover between them. Very few gray characters and you know what you're getting out of these. This book series is also extremely long and that can be a turnoff for some. This is over 11,000 pages long, and that is huge. It's going to take you many months, if not years, to get from the beginning to the end of this series. The cast of characters also can be overwhelming. There's over 2,500 named characters, and while you don't need to know all of them, um, it, it's going to overwhelm you. And what I suggest is that you download the apps that exist to keep track of the characters, and you can input what book you're on so it doesn't ruin anything about them and that you can look up the character and figure out what, you know, what's happened in the previous books that you should know by now. Um, but yeah, super helpful and it, because this can totally overwhelm you. Now there is a slog in the middle of this series and some people disagree on how long that slog is, but the generally accepted time is that three of these books have a noticeable step in quality from the rest of the books. Um, and it happens right in the middle of this series and it can be a turnoff for some. Now, it's not as bad when you already know that you can kind of grind through the series. And it was a lot worse, I think, when, when the series was currently going out and you had to wait you know, many months, if not years, to get the next book. But yeah, it's noticeable. Um, some of the POV characters can also be a little bit annoying. Um, and it, it's kind of famous for having these moments where not every single POV character you're going to be obsessed with reading about, like some other series that come up here. The pacing can also be a little bit slow. Um, you know, I personally don't mind that kind of thing in a fantasy story, but for those that want major action after major action, you're not going to get it here. You are going to get the pinnacle of action sequences here, but they're typically towards the end of each book, not kind of littered throughout. The prose can also get a little bit bothersome with repeated adjectives and actions. You're going to read about characters putting their arms into their breasts a million times. You know, you're going to read a lot of these kind of moments that happen. You know, a character tugs her braids. It's kind of over the top. And every time you read it, you're going to roll your eyes with how often it happens. And the last thing I'll say is that some of the scenes can be overly descriptive. When a new character walks into a room, they're going to describe every single thing that's happening in that room down to the color of the dresses people are wearing, to what's on the walls, what's on the nightstands. 
it's extreme. And if you like that kind of thing to fill in the story for your mind, great. But if you're like me, you're gonna be kind of skimming some paragraphs here till you get to the actual things that are happening because I don't care about all that. But if you're into that, you're gonna love it. Number five has to be The First Law by Joe Abercrombie. This is nine books, two trilogies with three standalones into the middle of those two trilogies. The first book is The Blade Itself. And this is a story about a few different people that have POVs that kind of come and weave together, but they're kind of their own individual stories that happen throughout. The first is Logan Ninefingers. This is an infamous barbarian who's finally run out of his luck and is left for dead when this book starts out. Then you have Captain Jazal Dan Luthar, and he's this dashing officer that's selfish and kind of a jerk, and he wants to become a dueling champion. You have Inquisitor Glockta, and he's a crippled torturer who used to be this hero of the Union, but has now been given this new job after he's been a cripple to be the Inquisitor. Um, and he's, his job is to cut out treason from the country. And finally, you have Baez. He's this wizard with a bad temper, and you're really not sure if he's like the world's greatest fraud or the world's strongest wizard of all time. But his storyline really connects the rest of these characters and they tie into what he's got going on. This story follows the fortunes and misfortunes of bad people who are trying to do the right thing, um, and good people who end up doing the bad thing, and stupid people who do the stupid thing, and a lot of combinations of all those things that I just said. The first pro that I have to say is the character writing. The character writing is sublime. Joe Abercrombie writes incredible characters and they come to the forefront here. And that's really the heart of what the first law is all about. You also have morally gray to black characters and these bad characters that you're gonna end up rooting for because of how well they're written. But if you're looking for characters that are a little good, a little bad, or mostly bad, you're gonna get a lot of that in the first law. There's also really good twists. It's not the best in the genre, but they're very good. The writing quality is just immaculate. You're gonna be gushing with how well this book is written, how intricate the plot lines get. It's just you know, a top tier book from a writing quality perspective. It does this really great thing where it has this mix of dark and gory, but also somehow like this wonderfully light and funny tone. And it's hard to put it into words how this is done, but you just have to read the book to get it. But you're going to get this constant blend of these two totally different things. It also has some of the greatest action sequences that have ever happened in any of all of fantasy. You know, very few people. All, personally, I'll say John Gwen might do it better, but that's it. These battle sequences are vivid and gripping, and they'll have you on the edge of your seat from the moment they start till the moment they end. This is also a very quotable book. You're gonna hear these quotes that happen and you're gonna have seen these pop up all the time, whether you've seen them before or you're gonna see them now that you're kind of getting into fantasy, but yeah, extremely quotable. This is also a completed story. The author finished the story um, earlier in 2022 and it's done now. So you know that you got a finished story. And finally, what I'll say is the audiobook narrator, Stephen Pacey, deserves a medal or like a big hug or something because he rocked it. Very few books I'll ever suggest that you listen to the audiobook over the physical book, but I will say it here. Check the audiobook out. It is immaculate. So for first law cons, the first is going to be this story is relatively simple. Um, it's not complex. You know, it's very bare bones on what the story is here. And you're not really going to even know what the major story is here until you kind of read a little bit along because this is a character book. That's why you need to read this. It doesn't matter what the story is to enjoy this, but if you're somebody that needs an amazing story, yeah, you might struggle here. Um, this is also a very simple world. Now, it's a big world with a lot of different places, but it doesn't go to them or go into crazy depth. Um, but yeah, it feels like the world building just is definitely not on the upper side of fantasy. This is also a rather slow series. The first book is known for being very slow without a very memorable plot. Now, it's one of my favorite series of all time, but I couldn't even tell you a lot what happened in the first book because yeah, it's just not very memorable. But I love it. I remember loving it. I remember the characters more than anything. But yeah, the plot doesn't really get going for a little while. And if you like it to come out hot, it's not gonna happen here. I'll also say that the story is not super well contained. 
you know, it does just involve a conflict over this one part of this one part of the world. But these major things are going on elsewhere that might even be bigger than what's going on here. But yeah, I'll keep coming back to it. But plot is not the strong point of the first law. I think you'll love it, but don't read it just for reading plot. Read it for the characters. Number six is Realm of the Elderlings by Robin Hobb. This is a 16 book series that has already been completed. And the first book in this series is called Assassin's Apprentice. And what Assassin's Apprentice is all about is this is a royal bastard who's raised without any knowledge about what his true lineage is. But in the very beginning of the first book, he's quickly adopted back into the royal family and given a job behind the scenes as the royal assassin. He's got a magical link with animals, but that magical ability that he has, which is called the wit, is looked down on by everybody, so he has to keep it a secret. But he can form these connections with a certain animal um, and become like totally tied with them and, and think know what they're thinking and they can know what they're thinking and share this deep bond. So for the pros, we're gonna start with the one that you're gonna hear routinely about this series, and it is the incredible character writing that happens here. Robin Hobb is the champion in the fantasy genre for writing compelling characters, and you're going to fall in love or completely hate some of these characters, but no one's ever done a better job at writing better characters than Robin Hobb. She can literally write about anything, and with the characters that she has, it's gonna be entrancing. So uh, along that line, something that she's done really well with the series is the character growth, and quite literally, the growth of this character from a, an adolescent into a, a very older man. And it's so fun to read this series that has these giant time jumps and show this character changing as a person be, based on the events that have happened. It's really special and unique about this series. So this also has a bunch of divergent trilogies. And so you're gonna read about five different trilogies, although one is a quartet, so 16 total books but they all tie together in such an amazing way. And it might not be clear how they tie together until later on in the series, but it's so special to read these totally different plot lines that finally come together towards the end of the series. And, and it's really cool to watch that happen. This is also, like I said, a completed story. So I know a lot of people love to read stories that are already done and rest assured, this is over. This is also a book and a series that's gonna make you cry. Um, and not always like happy tears, there are gonna be sad tears, but it's gonna make you feel a lot of feelings. And that partially goes to how well this is written. Now, a lot of books could write bad things happening to characters and you're gonna read it and say, oh, that sucks. But no, you're gonna be deeply attached to these characters. And whenever they go through trauma, you're gonna go through it right along with them. And it's just masterfully storytelling. It's also got some really well-written animal characters. Um, and, and a lot of books try this, but this book mastered it because you get to see the internal thoughts of a lot of the animals in this book. Um, and it's really fun to read about uh, that different aspect of things. So for the cons, um, what you're gonna constantly hear is this is a slow story and it is. Now big things do happen, but it's probably the least amount of big things out of any book that you're gonna hear me talk about today. It's slow. Now. You don't, you shouldn't read this book because of the story aspect of it. It's the writing and the characters that are going to make you fall in love here. This is also, like I said in the pro, qual pro column, but this is an extremely ex depressing series. Good things happen, but a lot of bad things happen too. But it's fun for me to read about this character continuing to get knocked down and trying to find the willpower and the strength to be able to lift himself back up again. Um, but yeah, it can be very depressing at times. Um, it's also kind of universally agreed that the, uh, the quartet of the Rainwild Chronicles, which I believe is the fourth of the series in this, is weak. Uh, you know, the first couple books are particularly bad. I've, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody that said they really liked those first couple books. And everyone agrees that this really stands out is weaker quality than the rest of the books. Now, luckily, it doesn't end there. It ends on one of the universally well-liked um, trilogies in the series. But yeah, The Rainwild Chronicles, not great. Um, but that's all for the cons category here. Number seven is The Kingkiller Chronicle by Patrick Rothfuss. 
This is a trilogy of books, two of which which have already been written. The first of those books is The Name of the Wind, and this tells the story of Kvoth. Um, and I might be saying that wrong, I've never read the audiobooks, I've only read the regular books. But in this story, he's telling the story of his life to the chronicler, um, who will write his entire chronicle uh, starting from his childhood up to his present life where he's an innkeeper at the Waystone Inn. And he tells the story of his life within the span of three days. Um, the Name of the Wind is the first day where he tells the story. Now, Kvoth is a magically gifted young man who grows to be the most notorious wizard the world has ever seen. So you should read this story if you want amazing prose and writing quality. Everyone's going to agree that this book knocks it out of the park. If you were to make a Reddit thread and said, what's the most well-written and the greatest prose of any fantasy story? I almost guarantee you this is going to be the number one most liked response. It really is so lyrical and poetic, and even from somebody who that's not the most important thing that I need out of a fantasy series, I have to just at times sit back and take in how incredible the writing quality is as I'm reading through these books. It also has a very wonderful magic system that's well thought out, well explained. It's not too overpowered or too underpowered. It fills you with a complete sense of wonder. Um, and ultimately, I think it's one of the better magic systems that have ever been written about in all of fantasy. It's also got a really cool school setting. Now, a lot of books do this. This book does it very well. It's not too, um, you know, immature. It's got a lot of really well-written characters. It doesn't feel too YA, although it does have those aspects to it. Um, but yeah, it's a really fun school setting and one of the better ones that I've ever written, ever read about. It also has wonderfully written characters. You're gonna go into deep dives on these characters' lives, what they're thinking, especially the main character. And it's really fun to read this story within a story because you can never quite be sure of, is he being truthful as he's telling this story and you know, overdoing the accomplishments that he's done. So it's really fun having this unreliable narrator telling the story. Um, and that's certainly been done a lot, but yeah, it's really well done here and the world building is very well done. There's a lot of different locations here. They all feel unique. You know, it's been a long time since I've read these books, but even I can remember what it looks like and feels like and smells like to be in these different locations. And that's the sign of a really great world that's been delicately crafted here. So for the cons, um, this series has a distinct lack of action. It does happen in these books, but when it does, it's not even like the most dramatic action. Um, and yeah, it's just not gonna blow you away in that regard. Now the writing quality is great, but yeah, the story and the action is a little bit lacking. The plot progression itself is slow. Uh, you're gonna have these moments, especially in the second book in the series, where you know many pages, if not hundreds of pages are gonna go on and you're gonna say, what are we doing here? Where's the story going? You know, I like the way it's written, but what's happening here? And that happens a lot here. This book also has the problem that A Song of Ice and Fire has and that it may very well not ever get finished. And it's so close to the finish line because two of three books have been written. But yeah, it's been a very long time since the third book was supposed to come out and it doesn't appear to be even close to coming out. And I think a lot of people doubt that it can be wrapped up in one book because so many things have to happen in this final book to wrap up the story that we know has to happen. And it's, it, it's really dubious and if that can be done in a single book. Like I said a minute ago, this is a little bit more on the YA side. So if you're looking for a really grown up fantasy that has all these adult themes, you're not gonna get a ton of that here. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, you, it kind of feels like these books aren't going anywhere. It's a fun ride, but where are we going? You, you understand from the first couple pages that he has killed a king and now we are gonna learn that story. But I don't even know if that king's been brought up in the story yet, let alone killed. So yeah, who knows what's going on with the story, but I like the ride. Number eight is The Gentleman Bastards by Scott Lynch. Three books have been written. Who knows how many are gonna be written because I don't think it's very well established how long this series is going to be. The first of those books is The Lies of Locke Lamora. 
And in this series, and in this first book in particular, we follow a group of elite con artists called the Gentleman Bastards, led by their leader, Locke Lamora. Um, now, the story begins with the gang trying to pull off the world's biggest heist that's ever happened. And the heist eventually leads them into something much bigger and more dangerous than they've signed up for. But yeah, each of these books is an amazing heist story in one way or the other um, that's really going to leave you with this enormous sense of wonder and so, so much fun. So there's a lot of reasons that you should check out this series. The first is, this is an amazing heist story. If you've ever liked that in your form of media like movies, this is the cream of the crop. It also has amazingly gripping plot lines uh, that are just so fun and, and just you can't stop reading these books for how good the plot is. It also has got great character development, particularly with the main character, um, Locke Lamora, and his best friend, Jean Tannen. And this buddy duo that kind of develops as the series goes along is probably the best buddy duo in all of fantasy. Now the series has this amazingly nice blend of light and funny with brutally dark. And I love a good book that can contrast these two totally different types of book into one. And this book absolutely nails it. The world building here is very immersive. Each of the books goes into a different, totally, totally different location in a different part of the world. And it feels so fresh and unique. I mean, in the first book, this is an urban fantasy book um, that deals with this very intricate city. In the second book, it's you're on the high seas and you're that most of the book takes place on a ship and it's so fun. And the third place, third book is a totally different story and a totally different city and involving this totally different plot line. Um, also, the dialogue here is so witty and funny. You're gonna laugh out loud at how the characters talk to each other. The dynamics between characters that know, have known each other for a long time is tip top. The twists here also are going to shock you and awe you. They're so fun, especially the twist in the first book at the end of it. I guarantee you, you're not going to see it coming. And when it hits you, it hits you hard and it's really entertaining. And finally, like I said earlier in this with the first law, the audiobook narrator here is mwah. Michael Page makes this book even better if you do this in audio. And I won't say this a lot, but you gotta do audio instead of the physical book or do both. But the audio book is just to die for. So for cons, and this is the last time I'm gonna say it here, but this series might not ever get finished. This author, just like Rothfuss and just like Martin, it's been forever since that last book came out. And no one knows if it's actually gonna finally get there. There's been this talk about how, you know, it's not even gone to the editor yet, and who knows where it's at, but yeah. But, you know, rest assured that even if nothing else comes out, it's still worthwhile to get through this story and you don't need an ending to this story to enjoy what's gone on here. It also has this weird plot line in the books of this magic user that kind of breaks the story a little bit with how like overpowered that this character is. And it makes you think a lot like, is this believable in the sense that this character could break the story in so many ways that it, it chooses not to. And if this character exists that has this near infinite amount of magical abilities, you know, why are they only doing what they're doing? And it just, it brings up all these negative thoughts about questioning the plot line involving this character. You know, I, I mentioned in the prose that this blends dark and light, but the dark can be overly dark for some. It is brutal at times, and they go into vivid descriptions of horrible events happening that can be overdone for some people that aren't used to that kind of thing. And the last thing I'll say is that people have mentioned that this book can be a little bit pretentious on the way that it's written and the way some of the characters dialogue with each other. And so if you're sensitive to the pretentious aspect of things, you're gonna get a little bit about that in Gentlemen Bastards. Number nine is Malazan, Book of the Fallen by Steven Erickson. This is a 10 book series that's already been finished. The first of those books being Gardens of the Moon. And instead of telling you what this first book is about, I'm gonna kind of give you a little bit of a synopsis about what the series is about because this book series is confusing. And if I told you what the first book is about, 
you're going to be lost on just what I explained. So let me give you a bigger overview of what's going on here. So this story is essentially about a group of soldiers known as Malazans and a number of others that team up to stop a growing problem in the world. That problem is the namesake of the 10th book, The Crippled God. He was this foreign god uh, ripped from a totally, totally different realm or universe through sorcery um, sometime in the past and is now causing major problems for the characters that are happening today. Um, this religion's been created around this god and it's starting wars across multiple continents. And in general, um, this religion's kind of being an asshole to everybody else in the world. So the book in the series is about solving this major conflict but a lot of other things at the same time. So the first reason I think you should read Malazan is for the world building. No one has ever made a better world, in my opinion, than in Malazan. It is just jaw-dropping, not just in the scope of this world, and the scope is immense, but how well detailed it is, how different all the locations are. Now, most books, if they take place in a, in a big area, it's usually on a continent, maybe two. There is a large handful of continents that exist in this book series, and they each are so different and compelling with vastly different races of people, not just on one continent, but each continent will have different races and different groups that are battling that feel so alive. I mean, I could read books and books and books of the history of this world, um, and it wouldn't be enough. So the prose is incredible. Um, this author just nails it. Steven Erickson can write the most beautiful prose in all of fantasy. It's poetic. It's magical. It'll capture your heart in the way that he can write these compelling characters and the way that he can form an incredible sentence that'll just leave you sitting back and trying to take it all in. So the, the micro arcs, and what I mean by that is, you know, this book can be kind of looked at is a lot of small stories that come together to make a much bigger story. But these micro arcs are what really makes this so unique and magical. There are hundreds of them that happen throughout the series and they're all just as compelling as the last, but it's just, it's a, it's, it fills you full, so, full of so much wonder when they all come together and when you're reading this little story about something that's going on and then it kind of drifts to the background and you learn about something else and they kind of get weaved together and getting taken apart and there's so many of them that exist and they're so well written that it's just awe-inspiring. You also should read this for the massive plot and the epicness of this story. This is epic fantasy in a nutshell. It's big, it's enormous. You know, the ending of the books, you know, I mentioned earlier about the Sander Lanch where these huge events happen at the end of a book and then it's just, it blows up. Yet yeah, this is taken, that taken up to 11. Um, the end of every book here, um, you know, every, they call it convergences where major powers attract other major powers. And at the end of every book, these enormous set piece battles happen and these huge moments happen. And yet you will not be able to put down the last 100, 200 books, pages of each of these books. And the last thing I'll say is the humor. Now this is kind of a darker story. I wouldn't say grim dark, but it's darker, but it's, they're so funny. Steven Erickson can make you laugh out loud and you're not gonna laugh throughout the series, but several characters in this are, they're just so well done in the way that they communicate with each other. You're gonna laugh out loud many, many, many times. So let's talk about cons. And it's hard for me to talk about this because I don't personally see a lot of these as cons because Malazan's my favorite series of all time, but I'm trying to give you an unbiased look here and tell you what the masses of people think about the cons of Malazan. And the first one is the macro arc. Now I mentioned the micro arcs being a positive, but the macro arc, the overarching story here, takes multiple books to even start to begin to start getting explained to you. And it just can overwhelm the reader when you don't really even start to understand the plot until multiple books in. The first book is also kind of universally recognized as one of the worst books in the entire series. So it might not grip you right out of the gates. Now, if you love the first book, I think you're guaranteed to love the series. But 
you can also not love the first book and still love this series, but I think a lot of people probably read it and said, it's not for me, when it might have been. Um, but yeah, the first book and the second to last book are known as being a little bit of a drop in quality from the other books. This is also extremely confusing of a series. Now, not to the point where it's too overwhelming, because you can figure out what's going on here, but this drops you in without holding your hand at all, using completely foreign lingo, and they expect you to understand what's going on, and you don't, you won't understand a lot of what's going on. Yeah, rest assured, you will get it over time, um, but you're not supposed to get it out of the gate. You're supposed to be confused, and that can be overwhelming for a lot of people. I'll also mention that there is a, a fair amount of sexual violence in this book, and it can be gratuitous, especially one of the scenes. It is hard to read. I mean, if you're sensitive to that kind of thing, it can, it can really hit you in a really hard place. Now, a lot of people say that a positive thing about this book is how philosophical it can get, but it can get overly philosophical at times, um, to the point where you're just like, okay, let's get on with it. Um, I'll also say that the amount of characters in this book is overwhelming. And there's, 400, there's over 400 different points of view in this series. Now, some of them are very minor. Some of them are very big. But it'll be hard to kind of keep track of everything that's going on here without taking notes. I had to take notes when I read this series and it really amplified how much I enjoyed it. But yeah, 400 point of view characters. That is insane. And the last thing in negatives I'll say is that this is a huge, huge series. And it can, it'll take you a long time to get through it. This is a like wheel of time. It's over 11,000 pages. That is daunting. And it can be tough for somebody that's not a major reader because it might take you years to get from point A to point B here. Number 10 is going to be The Dresden Files by Jim Butcher. Um, this is a huge book series that's 17 books in out of eventually 25 planned books. Now the books aren't huge. So this book series, even though it's so long, isn't as long as some of the other ones that I mentioned, but there's a lot of books. The first of those books being Stormfront. And I don't so much want to tell you about what Stormfront's all about, because I think I can give you a good overview about what the series is about without just going through the first book. But this is a contemporary urban fantasy book set in modern day Chicago. Um, and it's a told in the first per person perspective of the human wizard investigator, Harry Dresden who tells stories of his investigations into supernatural disturbances in modern day Chicago. Um, the books start with more isolated stories, but eventually get into these interweaving plot lines into a much grander epic story. So I think you should read this book if you're really into compelling characters. Um, how, getting to spend so much time with the same character, because this is all done in the first person perspective of this one person and you're gonna come to love Harry Dresden over time. And if you don't love him, you're just gonna quit. So if you continue on with the series, yeah, you're gonna come to know this character so intimately well, more than basically any character in all of fantasy because of how much is devoted to explaining about this character. This is a fun crime detective story type of book. They're smaller, they're easy to digest, um, and they're fun. Um, and they can be rather funny as well. Now, some of the humor might not hit for some people, but a lot of people talk about how much they love laughing right along with these characters and the sarcasm and how funny Harry Dresden can be. And yeah, they're light reads that are just enjoyable and funny. And I'll also mention that the audiobook narrator, like I mentioned before with a couple other series, but James Marsters is incredible. He tells these stories like he's some grizzled, you know, film noir type of voice. It's just, he's got an incredible voice. And if you listen to these audiobooks, you won't ever be able to think about Dresden Files without his voice popping into your head. And yeah, it's so well done. I highly encourage you to skip the physical books, go straight to the audiobooks. So the first negative you're gonna hear about this book from somebody if you're talking to them about it is that it takes a while for the books to get good. Even the author admits that the first three books are not great. Um, and a lot, a lot of people suggest that you skip the first three books and maybe come back to them after you fall in love with the series. But I think a ton of people read that first, second, third book and said, yikes, this is not good, when they might end up falling in love with it. So yeah, it takes a while to really get going. 
Um, Harry Druston also has a lot of misogynistic qualities to him. It's not so overt where he like things down on women, but he has this old school perspective about needing to protect women and children and you know, he's constantly thinking about sex and you know, it can be a little bit cringeworthy. Uh, you know, it's it's you might think of like totally neckbeard type of writing here with a lot of the ways that Harry thinks. Now, as the books go along, he kind of gets out of that a little bit, but for a while, it, it's kind of cringeworthy. Um, also, for a crime book, you, you shouldn't read these to solve the mysteries like a lot of crime books because they're gonna just kind of hit you out of nowhere. You need to treat these books as a form of entertainment and not so much of a, let me figure out who done it. Um, because that's not really what these books are all about. These are to tell you a story so you can sit back and take it in with Harry Dresden and be just as surprised as him when you find out what's actually going on in each of these stories. But yeah, you're not going to be able to solve these. All right, so that wraps up my 10 most popular adult fantasy series. I'd love to know your thoughts. Are there any book series that are super popular that I didn't include here? Let me get your breakdown of them in the comments. I'd love to engage with you and chat with you about it. And as always, happy reading to you.